This is Tom Fox, and welcome to episode 344 of the FCPA Compliance Report. The FCPA Compliance Report is sponsored by the ARC Group, who have recently published my latest book, 2016, The Year in Corporate FCPA Enforcement, Cardinal and Provident. You can find out more about my new book and the ARC Group by checking out their website, ARC Group. That's ARK-group.com. Today, I visit with Virginia Chuvet. She is a counselor on legal risk management, regulatory compliance, public policy, as well as commercial and international matters. She has developed a legal risk management specialized study certificate program at the University of California, Irvine Extension, where she teaches this as well as contract management. She has published a variety of articles on this matter, and we have a very interesting discussion about her academic pursuit of legal risk management. It's much broader than legal risk. It's regulatory risk, legal risk, reputational risk, safety risk, environmental risk, and she's really trying to get at a process or approach that you can take to the overarching concept of risk management. She talks about some of the current initiatives she has, the program at UC Irvine, and how it all relates to a best practices compliance program. It's a fascinating interview that I think you will thoroughly enjoy. The FCPA Compliance Report is a part of the Compliance Podcast Network. Hello, everyone. Tom Fox again for another episode of the FCPA Compliance Report. Today, I am thrilled to have with me Virginia Chuve. Virginia and I have been talking for a few weeks and she is a part of a program at um, UCI, Division of Continuing Education, which takes a look at risk management. She takes a look at it from many different aspects. And so I thought it'd be really good to have her come on the podcast uh, and talk about her views around risk management. She counsels on legal risk management, regulatory compliance, and public policy in both commercial and international matters. She's a subject matter expert on this, and she teaches uh, this as well. She's published articles on a variety of business law matters, most recently for the National Contract Management Association's Contract Management Magazine, May 2015 issue. She's worked internationally, having focused time in Europe, particularly in the emerging economies of Central Europe and Eastern Europe. And while at the U.S. Embassy in Bucharest, she researched and drafted reports for senior officials, including the annual Human Rights Rights Report. She's affiliated with a a wide variety of very interesting professional organizations, including the World Trade Center San Diego Project, Project Management Institute, uh, the Orange, I assume that's Orange County Paralegal Association, Chapman's University E-Village, Irvine Valley College, the Orange County chapter of the NCMA and the National, excuse me, the Native American Procurement Forum. So with that incredibly long-winded uh, introduction, Virginia, uh, thank you for taking the time to visit with me and welcome. Well, thank you very much for having me. It's a privilege to be on your program. So, Virginia, as uh, you probably uh, un- understand, uh, one of the things I think about a lot is risk. And obviously in my area, it's anti-corruption risk. But you have a much broader remit, and you teach courses on risk, but more importantly, how to manage that risk. So I was wondering if you might be able to start off by telling us, what is the legal risk management specialized study that uh, you are running? Yes, well, thank you very much for the opportunity to share that with you. So the actually, I'd kind of like to back up a bit and kind of describe how the legal risk management program at uh, UCI came about. Um, I was doing various uh, work. So what I do for clients, companies, is I, I go over their policies and procedures, uh, check for any questions they have with regard to compliance. So it could be on U.S. Export Control Program, or um, there might be some questions with regard to Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, um, but in particular, co- contract risk management. So if there's a government contract, look at compliance with um, federal acquisition regulation. And in that work, and I'm sure you're very familiar with this as well, uh, you begin to see patterns, um, no matter what the industry is, no matter the company, or you begin to see patterns of, well, how do we handle, 
our communication amongst departments because communication, frankly, is a huge area or lack of proper communication is a lack uh, really shows a huge area of uh, potential negative risk. And so through my experiences and then talking with colleagues, um, we, I, I came about with the legal risk management program about two years ago. I, I, I uh, proposed it and I said, we need to have this legal risk management program part of the Division of Continuing Education because the Division of Continuing Education, our audience um, are working professionals. And it's fascinating because who I've had through the program, it's not just general counsel, but I've had project managers, contract managers, uh, certainly compliance professionals. And then also, interestingly, civil engineers. And actually, one of my uh, civil engineer students actually wrote to me a few days ago and said, the program has been very helpful because as a civil engineer in infrastructural planning and design, I have the challenge of administrating municipal projects in a way that minimizes any adverse um, consequences that could come legally or from compliance. So I was immediately able to apply what I learned in the program to improve project delivery procedures and identify the legal and compliance issues requiring further research to reduce risk. So the program is a great option for working professionals who want to advance their careers in, in their fields. What you're beginning to see is more non-attorney professionals being hit with compliance-related risk to their jobs. This, this, and I'm sure you've seen this in, in your, in your, um, in your professional life as well. Could be the, and there are several reasons for this. Globalization of the economy, um, more complex transactions, looking toward emerging markets, uh, more complex supply chain. All of this impinges on these professionals. And so this program gives a very 30,000 foot view of here are legal compliance risks to look at. There are four core courses that we decided to have at, uh, looking at administrative law so you can understand government enforcement actions, contract risk management, both on the government side and commercial side of things, um, corporate regulatory compliance, and we also had a core course on uh, for risk management for entrepreneurs and small business owners. Now we're looking to expand the program into further emphases. So one of the emphases we're uh, currently looking toward is insurance. And we've um, decided that the best way to really amplify and uh, enrich our program is to is through uh, really good collaboration with uh strategic partners. So currently, we do have uh, strategic partnerships with the program with Project Management Institute, with National Contract Management Association, with the Institute of uh, Supply Chain Management, and uh, we're also looking with other professional organizations such as Chartered Property um, Casualty Underwriters as well. So um, you've, you've really articulated a large number of uh, professions, uh, uh, hierarchies within the professions. And the thing that really fascinates me, Virginia, is that uh, that really the breadth and scope of what you're offering. And what I wanted to really explore is, have you uh, been able to articulate or, or synthesize down a process by which really any professional, whether it be me as a lawyer or the engineer you referenced, can assess their risks uh, then put some risk mitigation strategies in place, monitor those uh, strategies and risk going forward, and then use that information to loop back into a feedback system to, for continuous improvement. Does that work really in a wide variety of different types of risks? You know, that's, that's a terrific question. It's actually fascinating because if you look at the um, legal scholarship on compliance and risk management, it's still underdeveloped. So you have several scholars like uh, Professor Jeffrey Miller out of NYU, um, or you have Scott Killingsworth who wrote an excellent piece, The Privatization of Compliance, um, from about a year and a half ago. There isn't yet 
a completely standardized way of qualitatively and quantitatively looking at legal risk. Now, we could look to the International for Organization of Standardization, uh, so ISO 31,000 standards, the risk management uh, standards, which came out in 2009, and they're currently looking to um, re revamp those. It's, I think the most important point is that we're sort of in the toddler stage right now of how do we wrap our hands to create a standardized process to identify risk and to treat it effectively and efficiently. If you look at the new, the old risk definition, um, so again, from 2002 from ISO was risk is a combination of the probability and scope of the consequences. But now if you look at the new definition of risk under the ISO 31000 standards, they use the word uncertainty. So they say the effect of uncertainty on an organization's ability to meet its objectives. So the debate now is, well, can we have a standardized process if we're talking about uncertainty? Because how do we quantify uncertainty? I think one way would be certainly to also look at um, the ISO 19600 series from uh, last part of 2014, which talks about compliance management systems, which further defines and parses risk down to risk is defined as the effect of uncertainty on objectives, and compliance risk is, de is defined as the effect of uncertainty on compliance objectives. I think if we were had to have a better conversation amongst industry Experts, so risk managers, attorneys, compliance professionals, and organizations are beginning to do this. Like there's um, ECI, which is the Ethics Compliance Initiative. They've uh, come out with a report, Principles and Practices of High-Quality Ethics and Compliance Programs, talking about risk and how we should better communicate with one another so we can come up with a better defined standard process of identifying, treating, and mitigating the risk. So if I took the word uncertainty, what? how does that work if I have a known risk, meaning it's certain, uh, as opposed right. to uncertainty? Does it work in that scenario? Right. It's, well, probably the easiest way to deal with this, because sometimes it can get sort of esoteric, is to deal with a very concrete example. So if we were to talk about doing business in emerging markets, we see that there are business opportunities which come up in certain parts of the world, which uh, we know if, if you were to talk to um, U.S. Embassy professionals abroad, they could give you an idea of here are the political, economic risks of the countries. And if we follow along with your expertise with uh, anti-corruption and bribery, they could talk about, okay, well, here are the risks that you would be dealing with if you go into country X. So there is a, a way to ask the questions if you're talking about an emerging market issues and strategies for a legal team. So we could look at making the business decision to engage. What is the role for the chief legal officer? What resources are required for adequate due diligence? Those sorts of questions really come to going back to ISO 31000, identifying the risk. Once we're able to actually identify the risk and, and work with that, we can minimize the uncertainty, if you will knowing what resources there are, and uh, using those accordingly. So if um, does one of the things I think about quite a bit is risk uh, being evaluated at the higher levels of a company. So mm -hmm. management, or uh, I think about it a lot in context of the board of directors. Uh, are some of the principles that you and others are developing, do you feel like that those can be uh, utilized by more senior levels of a corporate organization up to and including the board of directors? 
Yes. Um, and actually, you can have it where some organizations will say you can manage legal risk effectively just by employing the good lawyers to negotiate the contracts or having the panel of the approved law firms to turn to when being sued or they need to bring a case against a third party. Um, it really, at the end of the day, I, what, I've, what I've tended to see, the commonality, no matter the size of the organization or how the company is organized, is the proper communication, are the proper communication channels. Those who are closest to the work really know what the risks are. So if you talk to the contract manager or project, man- uh, or project manager, they can tell you, oh, well, we can kind of sense when uh, a potential breach of a contract will occur because we've been in touch with the third-party vendor. They would know how to be first to identify the risk. Well, how far up in the bureaucracy of the organization does that communication go so that they're able to effectively handle that before it becomes a negative risk? So another important point is treating legal risk as a part of the overall operational risk. And there is further research exploring that subject that um, is very important because that's what, again, from startups to all the way to Fortune 500 companies, not seeing legal and compliance as just another cost, but actually seeing it integrated within the overall operation of the organization. So in my world, that's called oper- operationalization of your compliance program by putting it uh, at the functional business or uh, corporate discipline, which is closest to the risk. It sounds like it's pretty close to the same thing. Yes, yes. And it also depends on how, how do we define risk. Um, if we look at, again, going back to ISO 31000, Essentially, it defines risk as neither positive nor negative, just the, again, we go come back to the word effect of uncertainty on the organization's objectives. But when we look at how, and again, there's no fundamentally set definition of legal risk, but kind of the consensus so far is that legal risk is negative. So look at loss to the organization primarily caused by a defective transaction, a claim or a suit, um, failure to protect an organization's uh, IP or or other assets. So really, if we look at one of these standards, which is very useful from the banking industry, the Bazell Committee, um, it's the Bazell Committee for Banking Supervision, or BCBS, uh, is the primary global uh, standard setter for uh, prudent regulation of banks. What the Bazell Committee did was they put legal risk in the scope of operational risk, and it actually gave lawyers a new way to view the impact of their profession on business. Um, I, I, I strongly believe, and again, through my experiences and then talking to various other uh, professionals as well, this compartmentalization of communication. Oh, legal is going to handle it when it already has become a huge problem. Or we're going to have our contract managers only handle it, but has con- has a contract manager actually been able to have a meeting with legal, with, with HR, with the other interested stakeholders to discuss how to identify the risk and then how to handle it? So, in in sum, it's a it's certainly treating the, the legal risk as part of the operational risk, understanding that it is part of the operations, and then also expanding it further into how can we better improve our communications amongst the departments and destroy the silos, if you will. Uh, no, absolutely. Um... I get that as well. So what sorts of techniques or tactics do you uh, uh, utilize in your uh, classes to help uh, your students uh, monitor risks that have been identified going forward? Right. So what I like to do in my classes is, yes, I'll talk about certain 
legal principle. So if, if we're talking about a contract, we'll talk about, okay, here are the basic elements of forming a contract. But then we move further on. I love to use examples. So um, be it enforcement actions, be it lawsuits, really from the real world. And then I ask my students uh, to share from their professional experiences what has happened. I believe that a lessons learned approach actually from those who have been in the trenches is the best way because from from those experiences, you, you can learn what best practices should be. Um, I also talk about the various theories out there right now, and it's kind of difficult to say what theories there are out there because they're being formed even as we speak. But I certainly share a lot of uh, information with regard to ISO, so ISO 31000, ISO 19600 series. We also talk about enterprise risk management and the criticism um, with regard to enterprise risk management. So it's really helpful to use those real-world examples and then see how it then ties in back to their uh, experiences. Another interesting point, too, is, and maybe we can talk about this further, we see the impact of compliance falling onto the shoulders of non-attorney professionals, but when does that actually fit un under that person's job description? So the question then becomes when human resources or Others within the company are writing those uh, job descriptions to look for those people to fit, uh, to do a, a specific task. Do they have in mind that, oh, if I'm going to be the civil engineer, but do, will I also have to understand certain regulations and then how to handle and mitigate the risk? So again, it kind of goes back to a fundamental understanding and a fundamental uh, acceptance of trying to communicate within these various disciplines. Should we have a multidisciplinary approach to legal risk? Yes, we should. It should no longer be a siloed and compartmentalized uh, view because it, having a compartmentalized view could lead to avoiding entity-threatening risk and seeing it and properly handling it. And I think this is where there's sort of an identity crisis now the difference between legal and compliance. Even though you have some companies that are, and talking with my students, talking with uh, people who have been through the program, they tell me, well, you know, our company, uh, we've just handled compliance sort of at winging it, or we've, um, we've just recently created a compliance department, uh, but I'm not sure if the person who's heading the compliance department truly understands, for example, the FDA regulations that truly affect our company because we've been farming it out to get the expertise for the longest period of time. Right. So going back to those uh, real-world examples, seeing what the pain points are, then really help inform, okay, maybe these are what the standards should actually be. So in terms of the um, types of professionals you're working with, do you find that companies have the necessary channels to escalate issues upwards? Or is that you've talked several times about proper communications channels being a key. Is that viewed as really separate and apart from risk management, The either a speak-up culture, or the ability to raise your hand, whatever uh, a, a reporting line, whatever it might be called? Is that really viewed as separate and apart from the um, uh, types of risk management techniques you're trying to uh, educate on? Yes, um, and that's that's a great point you raised because, unfortunately, still in many organizations, uh, from again from my experience and and also from talking to the students who are going within the program, there is a disconnect between re reaching the higher ch levels of communications if you want to communicate a potential negative risk. To okay, that's. Maybe we don't even have a formalized process, but if we do have that formalized process, maybe it's just under human resources, but it's not integrated within going to the right uh, stakeholders to, to actually listen to the problems that maybe the contract manager has caught. And um, one of the 
interesting aspects is that there are organization, professional organizations, so National Contract Management Association, which is the premier organization for contract managers, one of the main points they're discussing right now is how can we get our contract manager's voice to be heard more um, by by the C-suite, by the higher-ups, because it's the contract manager, again, the person who's closest to the work, who can identify when these negative risks could turn into uh, into 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 reality. Um, it depends on the culture of compliance within the company, the tone at the top that's set from the company, and maybe it also has to deal with the churn rate at many companies. Uh, they, I recently read a statistic where the churn rate for the CEO for Fortune 500 companies is at anywhere from 12 to 14 months. How can you then realistically, if, if you're going to have your CEO, essentially the face of your company, who may stay a little over a year and then leave, how do you truly internalize an effective culture of compliance? So then again, we come back to the problem of the people who are left to deal with these problems, the project managers, the contract managers, the legal team, other compliance professionals, they remain, but it's, it, 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 this issue of communication keeps coming up. Maybe we can create a standardized process within the next few years, uh, but with the movement of the economy and sort of how the law follows where, where the economy and business lead, perhaps it's the time that uh, more thought and more appreciation of those handling the legal risk really be integrated further into the culture of compliance and have more say. So that's, that's a huge problem. And I'm not sure as of yet what would be the best way, or can you have a can you have a standardized set of principles for all organizations, or will it be, or do they have to certainly be nuanced? If it's a large company like a Boeing or a 3M, or to a to a small startup, maybe our first step is to realize and acknowledge the problem, and then uh, realize that it needs to certainly be addressed. I wish I could be a little more concrete when I answer these questions, but where it's it's just such a living, breathing, huge issue at the moment. So I've talked to a lot of people about risk, and I would have to say you're the only person who's talked about proper communications channel as being one of the key issues you've identified. So I really look forward to exploring this with you um, in the future. Um, yes. So, unfortunately, we're near the end of our time, Virginia, but I was wondering if uh, anyone wanted more information on the uh, <clears throat> Legal Risk Management Specialized Studies Program um, that we've talked about in this podcast. Uh, uh, how would they find out more information? If you go online to UCI Division of Continuing Education, and you'll see there uh, a list of all of our programs, you'll see the Legal Risk Management Program um, available on the uh, uci.edu um, slash DCE, so University of California, Irvine Division of Continuing Education. So I've been visiting today with Virginia Chuve, and we've really had uh, what I've found to be a fascinating discussion that uh, is encompassed, um, started off with risk, then we moved to legal risk, and we uh, talked about uh, lots of different factors on risk, and as Virginia has emphasized several times throughout this podcast, Really, this area continues to the, to evolve, and if you want to be a part of this conversation, I would certainly urge you to uh, to do so. Uh, right now, I think many of us are, are looking at this issue and struggling with it and trying to come up with, uh, if not a unifying set of uh, principles we could articulate, uh, some basic guidelines that we could use going forward. So, Virginia, I really want to thank you for taking the time to visit with me. It was my pleasure. Thank you very much for having me. Hello again. This is Tom Fox. Thank you for listening to this episode of the FCPA Compliance Report. If you have listened to this podcast on iTunes, I would greatly appreciate it if you would rate our podcast as it would help in our rankings and help get the word out about one of the top compliance-related podcasts. Also, if you have any questions, please feel free to email me at tfox at tfoxlaw.com. 
I hope you will join me next week for another episode of the FCPA Compliance Report. And indeed, join me for any of the podcasts that I put up during this coming week on the Compliance Podcast Network. Thank you again for listening.